Hello and welcome to another old steam powered machine shop. You know, it's been quite a while since I set this shop up and started taking videos uh, about five years in fact. So I'm getting some questions from viewers about different parts of the shop and how I came by it and how I set it up and how it works. So <clears throat> I think in the next few videos I'm going to uh, cover some of that and go back and recover some of the equipment and, and uh, get the new uh, viewers up to speed on it. We fired up this morning and I got some planer work to do so we'll be short with this and uh, get right to it. Thanks for watching. This is the boil that supplies all the power for the shop. It was built in 1924 by Monday uh, Steam Hoist Company. And it was actually a boiler for a steam hoist. Got a fire going here this morning. And uh, about 60 pounds of pressure showing on the gauge. Uh, I fired it with uh, scraps and junk lumber, mostly. Some coal. I have a friend that has a woodworking shop across town and he supplies me all the scrap I can possibly burn. Uh, so I'll move in a little closer here. The draft for the fire is controlled by this door down here. And most of the time I keep, just keep it cracked open a little bit because I found that too much draft works against you by allowing cold air to go up past the fire, so you really only want to give the fire as much air as it can use. Up here we got the seam gauge and the water glass, which shows the level of water. Right now it's up above the top. These are called tricocks. And they're positioned at a level where you can check, double check the water glass. And you can see there's, there's water coming out of there, so I know that the water is at least up to that level. And the same with these down here. Uh, the valve to clear the glass if it gets sediment in it. Um, below that are the injectors. Try to get in a little closer here. These are the two injectors that supply feed water to the boiler to make up for the water that's used in the process of making steam. And these injectors have uh, steam input valves and water input valves. And this is a fine tuning valve for this one and a, uh, another one on the back for this one. And uh, What these do is they actually use the boiler's own steam pressure to inject water into itself. And you think, how can that possibly be? But <clears throat> it works because of several scientific principles and a little bit of magic. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the inventor back in the 1800s really understood how his invention work, but the steam condenses, when it, it works sort of like a siphon pump. You ever had one of those things that you hooked up to a garden hose to pump out your boat with, where water flows past an orifice at 90 degrees and it creates a vacuum and sucks the water in behind it? Well, this does it with steam. Steam blows across an orifice, sucks the steam, the water in behind it, which instantly condenses into water droplets which have much more mass. They're traveling at the same speed as the steam, but they have more mass so they're jammed through another orifice and it forces the water into the boiler. That's briefly how it works. It's more complicated than that, but that's briefly how it works. Um, this, of course, is the main shutoff for the feed water, which needs to be turned down now. This is an extra valve uh, 
to input into the boiler if I need to feed if I need to fill the boiler from a pump or something to get started with from scratch. This valve here controls an ejector, and I'll show you how that. These two tanks here are uh, feed water that comes in from my uh, rainwater collection setup, and uh, can't get to it to point to it. That little device right there is an ejector. And what it does is similar to an injector, but it's used for just moving water from one place to another. So the steam comes in the side, pulls the water in behind it from my feed wa uh, rainwater system, and uh, distributes, distributes it to these barrels. And when the water is in these barrels, I can put any kind of uh, chemical water treatment I want to in it and I use a little bit of uh, pH up to get the pH up to around 9 and I use a boiler compound called Boiler Saver that does a lot of good things for the boiler as far as preserving it and making it steam well. This is the, this hose pulls the water out of the barrel to the injector and I can switch it from one barrel to the other. This uh, drain here I can switch from one barrel to the other and it's the return from my heating system. I've got some radiators out front that I run a slight amount of steam through uh, to heat the front part of the shop and that's the return for the condensate. Up here you have the main steam shutoff, and then this valve runs the branch that runs to the small O&S engine that I originally ran the shop with, and I'm in the process of hooking up to a DC generator. This branch over here runs to the big engine that runs the whole shop. The chimney for the boiler I haven't talked about, I just forgot about it, but this chimney I built myself, it's cast of concrete around a uh, 16 inch diameter steel oil drums welded end to end for a flue. I don't know how tall it is. I intended it to be a little taller than this, but I got tired of hauling the concrete up the scaffold and buckets. Mixed it all with a by hand with a concrete mixer. Took quite a while to build it, but it'll be there for a while. This is the relief valve, which in this case is set for 70 psi, and it will open and bleed off the steam to keep the uh, pressure from rising above 70. And it's piped outside of the building but there is a vent on it so some of the steam comes inside of the building a small amount which basically keeps water from building up in the pipe and freezing boilers inspected by New York State Department of Labor twice a year have an external inspection and an internal inspection which it passed this year and there's a certificate right there on the wall. This is the main power for the shop. It's a 19-2, 8 inch bore, 10 inch stroke engine built by a company called Richards Ironworks in Manicolic, Wisconsin. I was very fortunate to get this thing. It's in very nice shape. It's probably rated at about 60 horsepower and would have been suitable to run a sawmill operation or a furniture plant or some other industry. It is absolutely gross overkill in this shop, but it just sits here and hums along at about 90 RPM and uh, does the job very well. The, the boiler is actually rated at about 15 horsepower, so you can see I'm a little short of boiler for this engine, but 
running the engine under such a light load as it is, it, it seems to work out pretty good. This device here is the governor for the steam engine, and it keeps the speed constant. Uh, when the engine is running, these balls by centrifugal force will be pulled outward, which closes the steam off, and vice versa if the engine is running along and a load comes on and it starts to slow down, these balls will drop in and raise the rod. There's a valve down here which gives it more steam and maintains the engine speed and it does it within a few RPM. It's a very sensitive governor and it works really well. Built by Gardner, governor works in Quincy, Illinois. You can see the builder plate here, Richard's Ironworks. This device is an oil pump. It's uh, pumps a special kind of lubrication oil uh, with this rod. It's got a ratcheting mechanism in here and as the engine move, runs this rod moves back and forth and the ratchet turns this shaft and there's a sight feed uh, spout up in here behind this plexiglass which originally was glass and uh, it's adjustable. It pumps it out the bottom out through a tube and up into the uh, main steam pipe here and uh, just a drop every minute or so is sort of uh, uh, absorbed into the steam and it runs through the engine and lubricates the slide valves and the piston and rings in the cylinder. The rest of the engine is lubricated by lubrication fittings of one kind or another. Some like these just take a squirt of oil now and then. This has got some cotton waste in it which allows the oil that you put in there to uh, slowly work its way down into the crosshead. And on the crankshaft end we have grease cups which you fill with grease now and then and uh, just give them a little turn and the screw thread forces the grease down into the bearing. The main bearings on this right now I have just set up with cotton waste and I just give it a uh, shot of uh, 90 weight gear lube every once in a while. The connecting rod also has a grease cup on both ends of it. And uh, once a day, a quarter of a turn is all you need on them. The belts in the shop are almost all leather and most of them are probably over a hundred years old. This was a new piece of belting that somebody gave me and I don't even remember who it was but it was a, a really valuable thing. It was a uh, 50 foot roll, a brand new leather belt and I've been running it here for five years on or uh, three years on this engine. This is a little bit loose. It's not quite loose enough to take up yet. In order to take it up, you have to cut the splices. You have to cut the belt behind the splice, which takes out about three quarters of an inch of the belt. And then you got to re-make uh, the crimp on uh, belt lacing. And I've showed how that's done in several earlier videos. Uh, as far as maintenance go, I just put a little neat's foot oil on the back side of the belts like once a year and that's all the maintenance I do with it. The smaller O&S engine here has been a real good engine and it, it ran the shop for three years with no problems at all. Uh, it had way more than adequate power, uh, but when I got the, the big engine, uh, it just sat here so I decided to hook it up to a DC generator which I have done and it has a speed increasing counter shaft here so that I can get the RPM on the generator up to about a thousand RPM which it needs to be in order to excite the field. So I'm still working on that. I haven't had time to really dope it out yet and get it 
producing electricity. This is a steam pump, uh, two inch bore by three inch stroke. Uh, very common thing in the old days. They used them to pump water every every way you could think of, and uh, it works very well. I've had it running a couple of times. I don't really have any need or use for it at the moment, but if I ever enlarge my uh, uh, rainwater collection system, I may use it to pump water around with. There's always quite a lot of interest on my barns drill here. They're quite plentiful around the country. There's still a lot of them around. They made these of this design for many years starting in about 1890. So it's very hard to tell what actual year this is. But I can tell you the history of it. Uh, my father bought this at auction when a company went out of business in Owego, New York called Champion Wagon Works and their claim to fame was they had some very heavy duty patents on heavy wood wagons uh, that they made for quite a few years and, and other things. And uh, this drill was in the auction and it was hardly used at all. And of all of these that I've seen, it's the only one with a square table. I don't know why that is or why they ordered it that way or what the deal was, but most all of them have a round table. I have it belted up to my line shaft. This is the uh, cone pulley setup. You can see it's got four speeds. And then it has a back gear, which is like a little planetary transmission set up in here. And then when you release that, it locks up. And then it's direct drive. When you have it in this position, it has a reduction gear in it. So you have basically eight speeds. And then also next to the comb pulley is a tight loose system that works with a foot pedal, which shoves the belt over onto the tight pulley that makes the shaft on the drill press run. That's like a clutch. And I'm running a cross belt here because the way my shaft was turning and the position that I wanted the drill press in, it would have run it backwards. So I run a cross belt to make it run in the correct direction. This South Bend lathe is a nine inch junior built in 1926. And it's like an old dog around the shop. It's kind of worn out, but it just has so much sentimental value to me. And I use it a lot. It was uh, my father's lathe. He bought it in an auction at the high school, local high school, after World War II when they got rid of all their national defense training uh, equipment. Uh, during World War II, they bought up any kind of old machinery that would run in order to teach kids how to do machine work so they could work in the defense plant or whatever and uh, so this is a remnant of that. The Junior has no power cross feed and uh, a lot of other things that you find on the regular South Bend it doesn't have. It was kind of a stripped down version and uh, in fact, it, it never had any thread dial, and I do a lot of threading on it, small jobs. So, uh, my buddy Tom and I built this thread dial, and it's featured on one of my earlier videos, but it's uh, basically made out of parts you find around the shop. It's adjustable. You can disengage it or drop it down into engagement. Four inch thread dial. Seemed to work pretty good. 
I've got a Chinese chuck on it, as well as uh, I have a three jaw for it, which is an unusual chuck. I have never seen another one quite like it. It's a scroll chuck, but I, I like it because it's short and close coupled to the bearings. The number one shaft is the first shaft that I put up. It's an uh, inch and 15 sixteenths mild steel. It's a piece of new shaft. And uh, starting on this end, the first pulley was the pulley that drove it from my uh, small O&S engine. And you can see that in some of my earlier videos. The next pulley runs the 9-inch lathe uh, over here to a tight loose system that runs this counter shaft and the counter shaft has a step pulley that runs down to the lathe. I also have an electric motor up there so I can run it when I don't have steam for like something simple and quick that I need to do. This little pulley on the end comes down and runs a quarter twist to a small drill press. Uh, it's a uh, Buffalo Forge. Little sense, what they call a sensitive drill. And working on down the line that wide pulley there uh, runs the drill press in a cross belt, get the speed, the direction right. Next pulley is the main drive to the engine. Next pulley runs over to the counter shaft for the shaper. And it has a tight loose pulley set up for a clutch and it should have a comb pulley right there it runs down to the shaper to match the comb pulley on the shaper but I don't have one so I'm just running at one speed for right now more about the shaper later and moving down the shaft the next one next pulley runs my larger lathe through a counter shaft with a tight loose pulley and a clutch and then a three-step pulley arrangement down to the lathe. Now I didn't have a three-step pulley to match the diameters on the lathe. This pulley here I made a wooden pattern for and had cattail foundry cast it up and I machined it in order to have a matching pulley. When I went to pick it up, the manual says, you know, you might want to want to make your patterns a little thinner because uh, this pulley turned out to be like 130 pounds. But I wasn't sure how much I had to leave the machine. Okay, moving down the line to the next pulley <clears throat> is the long belt that runs across the shop to the number two shaft and that drives the planer. That's all I've got on that shaft at the moment. And that is not a leather belt. That is a fabric belt that I bought on eBay. Seems to be working really well. A leather belt would have cost probably over two thousand dollars. Next belt runs the counter shaft for the little cutoff saw, Racine cutoff saw, and that belt runs all the time. There's a clutch on the saw. Next 
next pulley up on this side here next pulley is on the end of the shaft and that runs the transmission for the milling machine and the transmission has two speeds and a neutral both way too slow but that's what I got now one other thing I was going to tell you is that there are three hanger bearings on this number one shaft I had two of them I wanted them to match so I took one apart and took it down to Cattail Foundry and Emmanuel cast this one up and I machined it to match. Also, the counter shaft on the shaper has the same style bearing hanger but a little bit smaller. So I, and I only had one of those so I had him cast up one to match that so one of those is a reproduction and one of them is the original one and I can't tell right now which one is which. The same deal went with the cutoff saw. I had another even smaller version of that same hanger with only one of them so I had Emmanuel cast up one and uh, machined it and that's where that one came from. I like that kind of hanger so well that I'm probably eventually going to replace these three over here on the number two shaft. But I don't particularly like them. They're stamped steel, they're kind of flimsy and wobbly. I mean they work okay but uh, so I had a whole bunch of them cast up. There's five of them there. So I'm going to use three of them up on this shaft eventually. It'll also get the shaft up a little bit higher, closer to the ceiling, which will be good. So the number two shaft runs through the wall. out into the front shop and there's a there's a bearing up there with a shaft outboard of it that runs here to a tight loose setup for a clutch on the planer Get out here back so you can see it. The pulley arrangement on the right is just a clutch. It shifts across from a loose pulley that spins free on the shaft to the tight pulley that's keyed on the shaft. And it spins this counter shaft. And the counter shaft is actually part of the planer. The large pulley is the return speed on the planer and the small pulley is the cutting direction pulley which is crossed so you have one pulley across and one pulley straight so that gives you the forward and the backward on the table these belt shifters shift the belt one is on the outside idler and one is on the inside idler and when the table gets to the right spot where the dogs cause this lever to be shoved in it moves the belt shifters so that the belts alternately run on this center pulley which is the pulley that drives the table I got things squared away in the shop a little bit so I could get back to the rebuild job on the Lively engine. 
uh, it, I disassembled last fall. And I figured, <clears throat> where do you start, you know? Why not start with some of the easiest stuff? So here is the uh, slide bars for the crossing. And what these are are two bars that are parallel with the spacing between them. Crosshead slides back in. There's two on this side and two on that side. They're all identical except for the two top ones that are drilled and tapped for a, a lubricator hole. <coughs> These spacers here can be shimmed for alignment with the uh, piston rod and the cylinder when we get to putting it back together again. So, uh, <coughs> plan is to remachine these surfaces that are worn and rusted and pitted pretty bad uh, on the planer. And you can actually see the planer marks uh, in these, the way, so I know that's the way they were machined to begin with. And <clears throat> I wanted to run the planer and uh, show a job that's gang. That was done quite a lot in the old days where there was a little production job where a lot of parts they set them up in the planer all at the same time. So I'm going to set up all four of these bars in the planer and machine these surfaces here uh, all at the same time. They'll all be exactly the same height. Did a little work on the planer been sitting here for a while and uh, it's been very humid and hot and rainy and the uh, humidity affects the leather belts and uh, this one drive belt was quite loose so I cut the lace off it and shorted it up about an inch and uh, a couple of other things I'll show you. clapper box here has uh, three faces. They look like uh, vice jaws. They're actually uh, pads for the tool to bear against. And uh, they're pretty worn, pretty beat up, pretty warped. And this one is broken. They're made out of some kind of tool steel of the day. I don't think they're all that hard. So uh, I ordered up a piece of 4140 quarter inch and I'm going to make some new, uh, I'll show you where they go. One in the middle here, and one at the top, fits into a little groove, so they got to be machined pretty accurately to fit in there nice. Here's the clapper box tool holder pads made up and fitted into the slots, and uh, I'm going to try to knurl them on the uh, shaper, so we'll see how that goes. Cross knurling these cutter pads is really an ideal job for a shaper.
where I messed one up right there a little bit on the first pass, trying to hold the tool up and run the camera on a missed one, and you can't go back and catch the like you do on a lathe, catch a thread, there's no, no way to do that, so I kind of fudged it. With the pads installed, this is how the clapper box goes together. Taper pin will drive in tight. Tool goes in here. There it is, put together on the machine. Before I assembled that the last time, I gave those pads a quick and dirty torch and dunk heat treat. Uh, brought them up to just a very dull orange and threw them in some water. Uh, it warped one of them a little bit and I uh, flipped it over and did it on the back side and it straightened it right out. I know that's metallurgically totally improper way to heat treat these things, but it was uh, noticeably hard in the neural with a file uh, after, I, after I did it. And uh, we'll see how it goes. They may crack, but it's an experiment. The gang milling setup is going to work like this. I made a stop down here, which is a permanent fixture for this machine now. It's just a piece of bar drilled for uh, T-bolts. And that's the stop for the parts to pump up against. And I'm going to machine them side by side, end to end, like this. Now these things are called screw clamps or a lot of other different names depending on what part of the world you're from. But they're basically just a stop <coughs> that I machine with this for a uh, screw. These are just long hardened set screws, 5 eighths course, and they're in here at a 15 degree angle. So they kind of push down on it a little bit to hold it down, but it can't get anywhere. Main thing you want to do is have a stop at the end here that's quite substantial. 
<clears throat> then I, uh, these are uh, planter stocks that Tom made one day. And I've got a little fence here and a piece of filler material so that these work pieces don't fall on a T-slot. And so when these are tightened down, it should be pretty, pretty secure. But normally these would have a point, but since they're uh, hardened set screws, they've got a hollow uh, point, and I think that'll work just as well. But we're going to find out. So these are all set up. We'll tap them down in there, and uh, we'll run, maybe run a dial indicator across them just to see how they <coughs> shake out. Going to use a one-piece high-speed steel tool that I just ground up a couple of minutes ago, which takes forever. But it's typically on cast iron on a planer you use a flat nose tool. But I've had much better results with old machines that aren't quite as rigid as they used to be by uh, using a tool with a little bit of a radius on it. So this tool will go in here like this straight down and be fed across in this direction and uh, we'll take a very light cut and a very light feed and try to get as good a surface finish as we can. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, that's the first pass through about 10,000. And you can see it didn't clean up on the uh, front tube here. That was sort of just to see where we we're at. I'm gonna put a different kind of tool in there and take another 10 off. There are all four crosshead slides planed. I might take one more pass with a different kind of tool to get a see if I can get an even better surface finish. finished product okay well thanks a lot for watching and we'll catch you on the next one